Hello, everybody. It's Dave Neal, stand-up comic and host of Bachelor Nation News, reporting live from Scottsdale, Arizona, following the Clayton Eckerd v. Jane Doe evidentiary hearing, the trial heard around the world. And we had a wild day yesterday with a six-hour live stream, shared all of the content, and there's going to be a lot to come. We don't have a resolution yet as we wait to hear back from the judge. I'm being told it could be two to three weeks, but up to 60 days before the judge responds. I've got a lot to get into in this video which is going to be centered around, centered around how bogus the call for peace is by Jane Doe's attorney. Jane Doe in the Clayton Eckerd uh, trial uh, was accused of tormenting Clayton, Mike Maricini, and Greg Gillespie, amongst others, in an attempt to coerce them into dating her for multiple different reasons, punishment when they uh, no longer wanted to be with her. Uh, because of all of that, I find it rich, and sensational that her attorney would call for peace, especially with some of the things he has said to me. I'm going to reveal for the first time the email I received from her attorney, which uh, threatened me uh, with a very lengthy cease and desist and also extreme uh, weaponization of uh, the legal world. Uh, I'm going to read this for you guys. I have held off on it for no reason other than it hasn't really fit into a lot of the content I've covered, but it fits into it today. So we're going to get into that. But first, let's not forget, before I read his blog, which again, I don't understand why he's posting these. He's getting several views. Um, I don't know if he ever posted blogs before. Uh, he was on his way to his vacation, uh, but he felt the need to uh, dis. Clayton's attorneys on his way out the door uh, in calling for peace. Absolute unhinged behavior. I don't know if he believes in it all or if he's trolling people or whatnot. Um, he said this to about me uh, in the past. Having done many defamation cases, I can tell you, if Jane Doe sues the Justice for Clayton crew for defamation, it would be an absolute bloodbath, to use the metaphorical term like Trump did, not literally. Unless folks like Dave Neal have a really, 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 really good explanation for every for every defamatory thing they have said about Laura, my prediction is that by this time next year, Laura's horses will be enjoying some new grazing land out in Tennessee once the Neal family has been evicted from their home after losing a multi-million dollar defamation case in federal court. I really hope that doesn't happen. But at this point, I don't see how it's not going to happen. So this wasn't said uh, because he wanted to warn me. This was said because he wanted to silence me. He, of course, then, then went on to continue. And, and this is deleted. These vile scum, I mean people, are not helping anything. They are human cockroaches spreading feces on the floor and then spinning the facts to make them more dramatic than they really are in the hopes this will drive traffic and increase revenue for their sad pathetic lives. One day, these trash humans will wake up and realize that lying for money is not a good way to live, or maybe they will never see their sins. Either way, I look forward to reading their obituaries briefly before throwing them in the trash where they belong. Now, I can play the game that he wanted to play, but I really haven't taken the bait. I don't believe. I've kept my eyes on the prize like most of you guys have, and we've covered the case. The case that yesterday led a lot of people to have a lot of nice things to say. Seeking justice for Clayton Eckert said Deander completely destroyed Laura on cross. Impressive. That's right. They got Laura to admit to a new lie, which is that she didn't get her plan, uh, her um, uh, ultrasound done at Planned Parenthood Mission Viejo. She now claims she got it done in Los Angeles under a pseudonym. She never says what her pseudonym is. Uh, and also on the day that she alleged she got it done was on a Sunday and the Planned Parenthoods in Los Angeles are closed on that day. One lie after another being uh, caught, and yet somehow this is defamation, and he has the gall to ask or to write publicly that he wants his client to graze her horses on land that was owned by me and my family. So he said this, and then he sent his email the weekend of my um, baby shower. Luckily... I've learned how to get some pretty thick skin in covering all of this, but it doesn't make it any less egregious, if you ask me. So here's what he had to say yesterday um, 
following the trial. A trial with which, of course, went by way too fast. But I have to say, given all of the, the plethora of content, the patterns of um, uh, uh, crimes it, it seems she committed by you know faking the fiver ultrasound, the cancer documents, and all these things that really just didn't have time to be addressed all at once, uh, we really see how sinister um, the plot really was when it's looked at from a bigger picture. Let's read what he had to say. Uh, Jane Doe versus Clayton Eckerd. Now what? Some thoughts. If asked to describe the trial in one word-ish, anticlimax. By the way, he should have said anticlimactic. Anticlim- who, who would call a trial anticlimax? Sorry, that's terrible. I suck at humor. I know this. We do too. Moving on, I'm guessing everyone has the same main thoughts. Here are mine. Two hours for the trial was effing BS. Nowhere even close to enough time to have a meaningful exploration of the story. I agree. The longer, the more amount of time we would have had, uh, the worse she would have looked. Um, didn't have time to talk to Clayton. No closing, nada. It was like a New Year's Eve party that lasted from 8 to 10 p.m. Who does that? The lack of time cut both ways. It unquestionably hurt both sides. My pers- I, I don't think it hurt her at all. My personal bias, because what else is she going to say? All the, all the extra time would have been spent exposing her. My personal biased view aside, the lack of time hurt Clayton's side way more than it hurt ours. True. Our story was short and fairly basic. Did I get a chance to cover everything? Not even close, but we covered enough, and sometimes that's all you need. By comparison, Clayton's approach was and has always been to try and drag way too much extraneous BS into this case. I don't personally fault him for this. If he only limited our story to things that happened between May to November 2023, the story is nowhere near as interesting, and boring stories don't sell very well. And by the way, the reason why they brought all of the past into it is to show the pattern, a pattern that Gingras seems to want to ignore, but the pattern that absolutely exists. We've all seen it. In my experience, simpler is almost always better. Then again, Clayton's efforts to expand the case may have been a gold mine for YouTubers making sweet super chat cheddar off each new video. Legally throwing so much irrelevant dirt out there was a big, big tactical mistake, in my personal opinion. Well, we'll see about that. My rule, if and by the way, YouTubers like myself, um, and by the way, it's like he's got no problem saying my name when it comes to wanting to threaten me personally, but um, but wants to be more more bland. It's like, all right, call me call me out, whatever. You know, I, I mean, at this point, it's like I I stand by my work. I stand by what we've done. I stand by all of the evidence we've exposed. I don't care if it doesn't come with the sort of grace that could live up to David Gingras. My God. He said, my rule of a story requires more than 10 to 15 seconds to present. You risk losing your audience. Always keep it simple. Go back to basics. That is more or less the approach I tried to use today. And for the record, I had about 100 pages of questions ready for everyone who did not testify, which I promptly threw out the window once the judge made it clear how little time we had. Well, he knew all along how little time he had, but glad to see he had all these questions ready to go. Again, he made all these claims publicly. Wait till the trial and you hear the evidence that we have. Where was it? Where was it? They had no evidence. All they had was a doctored HCG test. That's all they had. And they had, and they had an expert witness who almost nobody found credible. Don't take my word for it. I've never asked anyone to think uh, you know, in any way other than their own thoughts. I just share my opinion. As a lawyer who has done this for 20 plus years, my view is Jane is an outstanding witness. Given the pressure she was under, I couldn't have asked her to do any better. Yes, the audience chuckled, GFY, seriously hurt Jane Doe, but I am beyond proud of Jane for what she did today. Oh, shut up. She wasn't an outstanding witness. He had to calm her down. And again, we'll go over all this. You know, there's so much we're going to have to go over, but I'm, I'm, I'm flying out today. Um, he had to calm her down. She was, uh, you know, and, and as soon as she was getting caught in all the lies and cross-examined by Deander, really, really punishing her with line of question after line of question, she was frazzled. And then she pretended to start crying when someone in the audience like gasped. And by the way, I'm being told that there were, um, you know, officers of the court that were kind of laughing and scoffing because of how ridiculous this was. I, I mean, I'm not, I, I'm not, I, I, I don't care about this because if I cared about it, I would have been in the courtroom. But when I went into the courthouse to use the bathroom, I was, I was striking up conversations with officers who knew who I was. Um, they, 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 this is an interesting case because I feel like for a lot of men out there, it is a case of an absolute nightmare situation. So for a lot of men out there, they're like, oh my gosh, this is insane. And of course, women feel the same way because you know a lot of very important issues have been um, thrown, thrown to the side here. So this article gets even crazier. 
Um, my number one thing is that I always, always, always want to get to the truth. Woodnick and Deander clearly don't share that view. This is just my personal opinion, but I feel they couldn't care less about the truth, and that's a shame. This really isn't the time or place to air all my grievances, but let me give you one example of conduct that I feel is way across the line. Jane admitted that when she got the 102 HCG test from October 16th, she knew it was bad news because it meant the pregnancy was in the process of ending, if it hadn't already ended. It's impossible to know for sure. In a moment of panic, she doctored the test to change the reading to 130,000 or whatever, and she sent that to Mr. Neal because she thought it might shut him up. What... So he says he wants to get down to the truth, but what he's omitting here, and by omission, that's a lie, uh, you're lying. What he's admitting here is that she also sent that doctorate HCG to Clayton Eckert. Doesn't he have the right as the father of unborn twins to know uh, about the viability of, of them if they were real and if this HCG test was actually because of a pregnancy? So case closed. Case closed. She said, everyone slams Jane for doing this, but not me. I compare it to the story from earlier this year where Princess Kate Middleton released a Photoshop image of her family after she had mysteriously dropped out of public view. By the way, comparing Jane Doe to a princess is rich. Rich. She went missing because she was diagnosed with cancer. She released a doctored photo as a way to, of trying to distract from that. The ruse worked for about two seconds before she was called out. Well, I'm going to call BS on this one because in Kate Middleton's doctored photo, it was like a photo that was, you know, here, here she is. It, 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 it didn't have any mischaracteristics of, of Kate Middleton being alive. They just were like, all right, they wanted to show her out and about doing something. Again, I think it's wrong, but it's so far different than doctoring medical information to convince somebody that you're weaponized and taking to court that you've got um, elevated HCG levels. Laura's 130,000 HCG test was done for a similar purpose. Laura only sent that to folks like Dave Neal. So he's again lying. She sent it to me and Clayton Eckerd in the same email. She never used it in court and she didn't fake the document for any malicious or nefarious purpose. Well, that is an opinion nobody will agree with. She doctored it because she wanted to convince me she was still pregnant or pregnant ever so that she could continue her lie, her scam, her fraud. She was just trying to regain some privacy. And yes, it was a dumb way to do it. Seriously, Kate Middleton has a huge PR machine behind her and she made the same mistake, different but the same. My point is that Deandra dishonestly, in my opinion, tried to misrepresent the facts by claiming that Jane Doe doctored the 130,000 HCG test twice. Okay, it's irrelevant. It's irrelevant if she doctored it once, twice, three times, or 10 times. What happened is that when Deandra was first asked, Laura, about the test, which originally said 102, Jane said she changed it to something much higher and she threw out a figure like 102,000. She didn't even, so that's kind of the point is that she doesn't even remember the number she faked it to. That HCG test for a lot of people that want to have babies that are pregnant or that are trying to become pregnant is a lifeline that they hold on to and you shat all over it. So she said, he said, anyone who was following along understands exactly what happened. When Jane was asked to describe the fake version of the document, she didn't have it in front of her. Based on her memory, she admitted changing it to a much higher number, which is true. Laura said something like 102,000, but the actual figure of the document was 131,902. Did Laura lie? Perjury? No. Laura simply didn't remember the exact figure. Why would she? No, she lied under oath previously, but maybe not in this situation. You know, <laughs> Birkin clock is still right twice a day. Deandra tried to twist that minor slip of memory to make it look like Laura created two versions of the fake document, one that said 102,000 and one that said 132,000. Deandra must have repeated that dramatic point three, four, maybe five times. But Deandra knew there were not two different versions of that document. She knew that for a fact. She knew this because there is no version that says 102,000. If you have one, show it to me, and I'll apologize and buy you nachos. So he actually used the 102,000 in, in statements because I believe he was the one who messed it up first. It doesn't matter that she, if she created one, two, or 50 fake documents. She created a fake document. So he's just trying to divert people's attention away from the actual um, car crash, which was uh, Jane Doe testifying. Find me 100,000 people sample size. And I don't think you could find five people that aren't related to her, that she didn't pay off, that thinks she did a good job given all of the information. All they have to do is watch the trial. So I don't know why he's trying to 
uh, prosecute this out publicly. She just needs to hire a PR firm if she wants to do that. And by the way, find me a PR firm that would take her. Good God. Maybe in DeAnders' mind, trying to take advantage of a small mistake like this is fair game. I don't agree. I don't agree at all. In my view, that's dishonest. It's trying to present a false impression that you know is false. By the way, this coming from the lawyer who called the cops on Mike Maricini, um, uh, who was lawfully present at court. The, he, and he didn't just talk to security. He called 911. He wasted uh, Maricopa County's uh, taxpayers' money for an absolute frivolous reason. But the truth is ethically compromised lawyers are part of this profession, which is why exactly why I refuse to walk away from this line of work because I want to do everything I can to help bring the truth to light. Even if, and especially because there are people like Deander and Greg out there trying to do the exact opposite. Dr. Mitchell had a lot more to say, but due to the time constraints, we had to limit his comments to only the stuff that mattered. And at the end of the day, Dr. Mitchell told me over and over and over, his view is exactly what he said. Laura was pregnant, no question. She got pregnant and the pregnancy failed pretty early on. We can't know exactly when, but every single data point we have lines up with that narrative. That's the problem. They don't have any data points. And the other expert said we would need more data points to determine what her HCG test was a year ago and a year after. Uh, the fact that they don't have any of this information shows... They don't know for sure whether she was pregnant. And this is a doctor who never even tried to contact Planned Parenthood. When cross-examined, they said, did you ever try to get a records from Planned Parenthood? He said, no. That's why this is a fraud. He didn't, want to, he didn't want to use his expert opinion to be a doctor and look at as much science that's available. Why? Because there is no ultrasound from Planned Parenthood because she made it up. And she said she did it with a fake name and the judge is going to see right through it. And by the way, those crocodile tears that she had that, that caused them to go to recess so she could, uh, you know, regain some composure. I'm being told the judges see right through that, that they've done this long enough and they know what's going on. And while that might affect a jury, it doesn't affect a bench trial. So he says the Planned Parenthood sonogram isn't part of that analysis because as we know, it can't be verified. So we just don't consider it. So for that reason, uh, they don't consider it because they couldn't find it. If you can't find an ultrasound, it doesn't exist. There is no pregnancy. But as for the objective facts, we do know are genuine. They all support Jane's story, all of them, literally every single one. Yeah, except for the ones she made up. Dr. Mitchell had no bias in this case. He never met Laura or family prior to this case, and he wasn't doing any, any, anyone a favor. He was not a friend of a fan, you know, whatever. He was paid for his time, and we disclosed every detail of this to Woodnick without him even asking for it because transparency is important. If transparency is so important, how come he is already misrepresenting who she sent the doctored HCG test to? At the end of the day, I'm not going to make any predictions about how the court will rule. Once we get the ruling, I might offer some views about it or I might not. I've said this before and I'll say it again. If I believe the court made a decision that's legally incorrect, we will pursue an appeal. But because I don't know what the judge is going to do, I'm not going to speculate about what the future looks like. Yes, Jane was upset when the audience laughed at her. I can't believe how strong Jane was to sit there with a courtroom full of people just projecting hate, hate, hate towards her. Jane is such a good person. She just has been so unfairly portrayed in all of this. I've gotten to know Jane extremely well over the last two and a half months. She is nothing like what people think. Well, why, not, why doesn't she come on driving with Dave and we'll chat? I also don't think today was the cakewalk Clayton expected. When the trial ended, Clayton sat at his table looking like he was about to cry. He didn't. On my way out the door, I did wish him well, and he returned the compliment. The comment. The fact that the trials are emotionally brutal for all parties, that's why it's called a trial, because uh, she exp the experience is extremely difficult. I didn't have an opportunity to make a closing argument, so I'll end this post with a few final thoughts. Legal issues and arguments aside, my personal view is that both Clayton and Jane Doe need to learn from this, move on to become better people, both of them. Both of them made mistakes. Both of them did things they shouldn't have. Both of them need to remember to error is human to forgive is divine so kids stop fighting you don't have to kiss and make up but jesus can't you just let this go and that's mostly a question for clayton since laura tried to let this go six months ago uh by the way i would love to see laura sign paperwork that says she never talks about any of these cases again but we know that she's going to wear this as some sort of um you know uh, you know another case of, of how she was um mistreated in her victimized life Clayton and Laura are still both young. Laura, like any woman, wants to have a family. She wants to be loved. She wants to be happy. I'm sure Clayton does too. She's not that young, folks. We outsiders should not be focused on how to destroy either of them. We should focus on how we can help lift them up, both up, guiding them to be better people. No person is beyond salvation. Don't care what they did yesterday. The question is, what will they do tomorrow? Uh, I care what they did yesterday, uh, especially if they don't admit to doing it.
At the end of the day, as everyone knows, I am a seriously imperfect person, all sorts of mistakes, many of which were way worse than anything Clayton or Laura did here. But I learned from my mistakes. I own them. I still own them. And I've grown and moved on. And I'm proud of that fact. One of the most imp- uh, powerful things any human can do is accept their own flaws. Don't fear them. Use them. Use your mistakes as a ladder you can climb up, not as an anchor that defines you and ties you to your past mistakes. Make a mistake. Own it. Get up. Dust yourself off. Apologize and mean it. Then move on and don't do it again. Once this case is finally closed, the debate about whether justice was served will always linger. A court can rule that Laura was never pregnant, just like a court can say O.J. Simpson didn't murder his wife. Courts are funny like that. Everyone in the legal system tries their best to find the truth. Well, most of us do. In the end, sometimes we succeed and sometimes we fail, but we always keep trying. This is, this is um, disgusting. It's disgusting because it's complete gaslighting of the situation. Completely. Um, so much truth was exposed by Woodnick Law and by the Justice for Clayton crew. And to say that they are a hateful, hateful, hateful group, it's just not true. Um, I saw tears of joy. Um, there were tears of joy that, um, and so many stories that were explained to me yesterday. Mike Maricini and his wife uh, talking about how when they found out that money was raised for them to authenticate the text messages where she faked cancer and coerced him into staying in a relationship before getting him involved in a very brutal um, restraining order, uh, they talked about the tears they shed that day. They talked about the tears they shed when they found out there was a community of people that believed them. They shared that information with us. We shared it on today's morning podcast, The Rush Hour with Dave Neal. We shared the story of Greg coming up and expressing his thanks to everyone for giving him the space to share his truth. It is all of these truths, Greg, Mike, Clayton, that are getting exposed that feel like hate to her, but their truth isn't their hate. So we shared with you how he threatened to uh, make my family go homeless, a family that I, you know, I've worked really hard to provide for um, in ways that, you know, I don't think Jane will ever quite understand, uh, you know, coming from nothing and making something out of that rather than Jane's situation where she comes from something and makes nothing out of it. So we're called all these names. And um, at the same time, on the weekend of my baby shower, as my wife was um, full term pregnancy, uh, this is the email I received. Let's just read it in its entirety. He writes, grab your paddle, the douche canoe speaks. Which, by the way, not a name I ever gave him, but whatever. So, um, let me just try to make this the right size here. You guys can see it okay. Dave, and again, this is, pro- this is I'm most likely my first contact with him. A free speech lawyer emailing a journalist. Dave, on my desktop, I have an eight-page cease and desist letter with your name on it. Send it over. I was going to send this over to you today after drafting the letter yesterday. After sleeping on it, I changed my mind. And it's like, he's the lawyer. He's not the one in charge of sending out a cease and desist. Did she want him to? Like, what's the deal? Instead of sending the typical blowhard demand letter that lawyers always do, I'm going to try a different approach. And that approach, as you're about to see, is subtle threat. You seem like the kind of guy who probably wouldn't care that much about a legal cease and desist. To be honest, they bore me too. So maybe if we approach this differently, it will be more productive. And by the way, most of the evidence we uncovered came after this, but we already had smoking gun evidence, but we still continued to work hard to cover this, uh, thanks in part to all of your support. Let me explain the goal. I'm trying to help Jane Doe. You and I may not agree on many things, but I'm sure you would agree Jane needs some help. Same can be said about Clayton, but he's not my client. Jane is. Jane's goal is pretty basic. She wants you to leave her alone. If I was in her shoes, I'd feel the same way. Most people would. And by the way, I've never reached out to Jane Doe. I don't say her full name. I don't share her face, really. I've never reached out to her. She's obsessed with me. I'm married, very happily. I've got a beautiful wife and a beautiful family. Leave me alone. Having spent all of 10 business days on this case, which is nothing, I'd predict no matter what I say in a cease and desist or how strong of a legal threat I present to you, you're not going to stop talking about Jane at least not until June 11th when her case is over. I'm a good lawyer, but you and I both know you have a First Amendment right to talk about matters of public interest, and I'm the last guy on earth who would try to deprive you of that right. Okay, cool. So Jane is going to have to put up with you a little longer. That being the case, there are things you need to know. I saw your recent video yesterday, which was totally, which was mostly about me. 
It seems you're interested in learning more about me. So flattering. Why haven't you just called? I mean, if you want to know more about someone, shouldn't you just ask them? Isn't that what real journalists do? I've talked to lots of them, and trust me, they're not shy. They call a lot. Well, no journalist here wants to talk to you. So maybe maybe they just, um, it's not that they're shy so much as they've got better things to do with their time. I get that you never heard about me before this case. That makes sense. Internet law probably isn't something you follow closely. If you did, you'd know exactly who I am. And if you knew my whole story, you would probably have a very different tone. So let's see if we can change the tone a bit. Okay, so now we enter the dick measuring segment of his email, um, which might have been impressive if I was like 13. The goal, uh, you know, uh, dick measuring is impressive before you hit puberty. And now we're like, okay, Bubba, we get it. Cool. You're a lawyer. The goal is not to make you like me. The goal is not to make you fear me. The goal is to help you understand who you're dealing with. It's also part of that whole sunlight is the best disinfectant thing, a view I strongly share. So he shares the view that sunlight is the best disinfectant and then asks me not to share this email that you're going to see right now. So let's get some sunlight on my story. It all starts with Marty Singer. Ever heard of him? No, just Google Marty Singer attorney and look at the drop down tab under who was Mar- who has Marty Singer represented to see the list. I'll quote it for you. Singer has represented clients, including Sylvester Stone, Scarlett Johansson. Good. Got that. Marty Singer is the most powerful lawyer in Hollywood. I don't even know who the second and third most powerful guys are because Marty eclipses them all. Dude is literally the legend, goat, the godfather of celebrity law. Marty is also a friend of mine, although when we first met, he was like Greg Woodnick. Marty hated me. The reason I am friends with Marty Singer goes back to the Colin Farrell lawsuit I mentioned in a blog post recently. You would love that story. I'll share a little of it with you. In 2005, Colin Farrell made a sex tape with his girlfriend, a Playboy bunny named Nicole. After they broke up, according to sources, I have not personally verified and thus can't confirm. Nicole got into some trouble after she bought a kilo of cocaine in Miami and couldn't come up with cash to pay her drug dealer. To raise money fast, Nicole offered to sell her sex tape with Farrell to the highest bidder. Back then, this was a huge deal. The Paris Hilton sex tape had just dropped, and everyone wanted to see the next big celebrity tape. At the time, Colin Farrell was a super popular, way more than he is today. Nicole thought she could get $5 million or more for the tape. Colin Farrell hired Marty Singer to sue anyone involved in trying to release the sex tape. At the time, my firm represented an adult website that Nicole approached and offered to sell the tape. Marty sued my client, even though my client never actually bought the tape and never published it. I saw that case on my boss's desk, and I jumped right in with both feet. I spent months battling Marty in court. The stuff I filed infuriated him, but I kept going and wouldn't back down. The case was such big news, I had a film crew following me around in my house office in court with my permission. They filmed me for weeks to cover the story. I still have some of the video if you want to see it. I don't. Um, I eventually flew to New York City to take... Uh, to Colin Farrell's deposition. He hated me. My client leaked some information about the case to the media and Farrell thought incorrectly that I was the leaker. During his depo, Colin literally banged his fist on the conference table and screamed at me in a strong Irish accent, did you do it, Gingras? That was Scottish. Did you do it? Man to man, tell me, did you do it? My response, this is your deposition, Mr. Farrell, not mine. I am the one who gets to ask questions here, not you. Reading that back all these years later, maybe I am a douche canoe. I should not. I should have been nicer to Colin. After a break in the depot, the lawyers, and by the way, I don't know why he's emailing me this. After a break in the deposition, the lawyers, there were lots of them, went into a side room to talk. We quickly all said the same thing. Why are we fighting over this? By that time, the tape had leaked online. We didn't leak it. We assumed Nicole did to force Colin's hand. It made no sense to keep going and spending more legal fees. After realizing there was no point in fighting, we settled the case in 15 minutes. We then ordered sandwiches and sat around talking with Colin about how he really wanted to be a soccer player, but that didn't work out, so he became an actor instead. It's a funny story. It's a fun story, but no- nothing tells a story like pictures. So here's a shot of my client and his wife with Colin in after we settled the case. I personally took that photo and I think Colin wanted to reach through the camera and punch me. Just look at him. The vibe is so hostile. Um, see, I piss a lot of pe- I piss off lots of people. It's not just you and Greg Woodnick. By the way, I'm not really pissed off by him. I'm just confused why he cares so much about me. It comes with a role. I mean, I mean for him, I'm just a, a, a low life YouTuber. Why does he care about me? Um, it's bizarre. I guess Jane Doe sold him on me being such a cool guy. He says, it comes with the role I play in these things. I'm not here to be anyone's friend. I'm the warrior who fights big battles for my client. The people I am forced to fight typically hate me. Of course they do. I kick their asses and I win. Of course they hate me for it. On the other hand, my clients love me. My bookcase is covered with thank you notes. I even have an engraved, and by the way, I got a nice little, I got this today. This is an angel that was sent to me. So you get thank you notes, I get angels, bitch. (laughs) Um, Why don't you just call me? It's like, who's more needy, Jane Doe or her attorney? Golly. I'm not going to call you. Why? Because I value my time and you don't get a piece of it. 
Um, unless you want to call the cops on me or something. Uh, on the other hand, my clients love me. He says, I even have an engraved clock a client gave me from a shop in the mall. She cried when I won her case. Opposing counsel, if they are good, usually grow to respect for me because they see the results I get for clients. Mm, check your Google reviews. On the other hand, bad lawyers really hate me because, I don't know, I stopped their evil plans from working. Who knows? After the Farrell case ended, Marty Singer was so impressed with my work, he offered me a job. Not going to lie, that was tempting. I mean, Brittany effing Spears would be a client. Um, hit me, baby, one more time is right. I don't, I don't even know what he means. But I hate Los Angeles and I was in my mid-30s. I just didn't want to spend the rest of my life working 95 plus hours a week in that high pressure environment, so I turned Marty down. Despite me rejecting his offer, Marty and I remained friends. We still work together from time to time. In 2013, Marty called me and asked if I would help a very wealthy client file a defamation action against a lady who was spreading false information about him. Well, luckily, I haven't spread any false information. He said, I almost never take plaintiff side defamation cases. Easily 98% of the time I represent defendants being sued for defamation, not plaintiffs. Hence my Twitter bio. But when Marty Singer calls and asks for your help, there's only one response. Yes, sir. All right. So you're Marty Singer's bitch. Side note, my wife and I joke about this anytime we're on vacation or out at the lake on our boat after, and my phone rings unexpectedly. She always says, that's Marty Singer calling, answer it, because it usually is. Oh, this guy really is Marty Singer's bitch. So I filed the case as co-counsel with Marty's firm, and we obtained a very nice settlement for their client. Terms are confidential, so I can't exact, explain exactly how many zeros were on the check, if any. The outcome made Marty look good, so he was happy. That's how I got hired by Johnny Depp in 2016 to defend a defamation case filed by Amber Heard against Johnny's best friend. It was another referral from Marty. Think about that. The most powerful lawyer in Hollywood told Johnny Depp, hey, if you need help with a defamation case in Arizona, there's only one guy to call, Gingris. That literally happened. I'm not an overly boastful person, but not going to lie, that clout matters in this business. Hate-filled opinions of anonymous Redditors couldn't care less then why do you respond to them? Uh, this also helps put some perspective on how unbelievably little I care when some no-name MAGA cult wannabe YouTuber calls me a douche canoe. I already forgot about her before I finished writing the last line, which again, we know isn't true because clearly he's um, continued to think of her for months after this. I'll thank you, God, a crush on alt-right Oprah. Uh, you get an insurrection. You get, I'm just kidding. We love Meg. She's not alt-right. Uh, she's okay. She's a-okay. Getting back, she's she's great. Getting back to my story, she laughs like this. <laughs> she kind of, Megan Fox laughs like Tucker Carlson. <laughs> she's probably laughing right now. Get uh, Getting back to my story, more than 15 years later, the Farrell, the Farrell, Colin Farrell case is still playing, paying dividends. About a year ago, I flew to LA to spend an entire day shooting an, an interview with Netflix for a documentary about celebrity sex tapes. And the Farrell case was one of the first biggest in the story. As a star lawyer on that one, Netflix was dying to hear my thoughts. Here's a photo from that interview, which hasn't aired yet. I'll send you a link when it does. I can't wait. Or better yet, no thank you. And let me explain something else about my legal practice. If you're digging into my past, and hell yeah, there's a lot to dig into. And by the way, I wasn't. I haven't shared one thing about his past. You may have seen the stories about the cheerleader case I worked on from 20, 2009. If you haven't read about that case yet, you need to. The details are too long to explain. Well, what's stopping you now? But that was a case that went on for five years in federal court. We had two separate jury trials, each a full week long. The case dragged on and on forever. The trial judge was a good old Southern boy, about 90 years old. He didn't like me and didn't like my client, so he ruled against me on absolutely everything. I filed at least four or five different motions asking the judge to toss the case, and he denied them all. The judge also gave the jury an intentionally incorrect jury instruction to make sure we lost, and we did lose the second trial, but little did the judge know that was exactly what I wanted to happen. Oh, he wanted to lose. He goes, I win all the time, except when I lose, which means I wanted to. By losing the trial, it blew up the story. Ah, oh, this guy's playing 3D chess. We then moved the case up to the Court of Appeals, which unanimously ruled in my favor. We got so much media attention, I stopped doing interviews unless they were for big national networks. I even interrupted a family trip to Disney World so I could appear on the Today Show on NBC. Uh, I'm sure your kids loved that. Of course, we won complete and total victory. The plaintiff, the cheerleader, ended up cutting a sizable check to my client when, it, when I was all over, when it was all over. She claimed she was going to take the case to the U.S. Supreme Court, but to my great disappointment, she folded before that happened. I know this is a lot of information, but since you obviously don't know me, I hope this gives you a clear picture of who I am. You clearly think I'm some little league softball player. In fact, I've played nothing but major level playoff games for 15 plus years. Haven't won the World Series yet. Supreme Court of the United States of America, but that's just a matter of time. 
This story also explains why my style is a little different than you might expect. I've just fought so many huge battles, and I've defeated so many arrogant but useless enemies. It's caused me to have a different perspective of how the legal system works, and I've personally watched lawyers implode their legal careers right before my eyes. Example of about 20 I could give you. The lawyer from the, for the cheerleader, his name is Eric Dieters. Yep, after we lost a case, he went to jail. Lost his law license, was even recently fined for pretending to be a lawyer. Think about that. My former adversary busted for pretending to be a lawyer. You literally can't make that up. Because of all my crazy experiences, I just don't tolerate people who screw around in court. I don't tolerate people who lie. I don't tolerate people who bend, break the rules. I follow the rules to the letter, and I expect everyone else to do the same. Speaking of which, let me bore you, you already have, with one other fun story before I wrap this up. This is a little story about what happens to people who break the rules. Back in 2006, one of my clients was sued by some lawyers in Florida. The details are boring, but the important thing to know is the lawyers lied about the facts of the case. It was not a mistake. They told the court things they knew were not true. This was a dumb idea for so many reasons, mostly because lying just doesn't work. The truth Truth always comes out, always. That's another cheesy cheese ball saying I like. Winners never lie and liars never win. If only that was true more often. And by the way, we haven't lied about one dang thing. And we are winning the case publicly. After the truth came out, I won the case they filed against my client. I then turned around and sued the Florida lawyers in federal court here in Arizona. If you really want to do your homework, that case was Magician versus Whitney Information Network. Uh, if you look deeper at the case caption of all parties, you will see who the defendants were, a lawyer named Scott Rothstein and his firm. After I sued him, Scott wrote my client a six-figure check to get out of the case. A short time later, Rothstein was disbarred and sent to prison. Seriously, not kidding. Do you notice a pattern emerging here? I win cases. My opponents, the dumb ones, usually self-destruct in spectacular fashion. It kind of sounds like he just exists in a very toxic world. <laughs> That's what he's... The smart ones settle early and go home. Their lawyers often get disbarred and go to jail. The fact this has happened in more than one prior case I've worked on still blows my mind. Contrary to what you may think, I always play by the rules. If you put aside the DUI, come on, Arizona has the strictest DUI laws in the country and a few other little mistakes. I've had a totally trouble-free professional career here. I've never been sanctioned by a court. I've never lied to anyone about anything, period. Why lie? I don't have to. I don't take cases where lying is needed. I just win on the facts in the law, and I don't want to go to prison and take showers with Scott Rothstein and Eric Dieters, so I don't lie. And there is one last thing you should know about me. If you think I am only here to help Jane, you're wrong. I have told you, and I've told Greg the same thing. If Jane is lying, I will withdraw from this case in a heartbeat. And if Jane is lying, she will lose this case. And I won't lose a wink of sleep over that. If Jane is lying, she should lose this case. Again, since he wrote me this letter, we exposed pff, at least four different lies. She lied about the Planned Parenthood, um, uh, 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 the, the header from S from Smile. She lied about the fact that it was Mission Viejo. She lied about the fact that then it was Los Angeles. She lied about the Fiverr logo. She lied about the cancer. Um, she claimed she never said she had and we authenticated. She lied about the HCG test. She lied about the other ultrasound image she sent to me. She lied in several different courts when she explained that in different ways that it wasn't hers, even though she, uh, you know, it's just, it's, unbelievable the ways she lied and this man who lives by the facts of the laws says i will drop her if i find out she's lying then later on he retracts that spinelessly and moves the goalpost and say well those lies didn't matter so who is he to decide which lies matter who is this attorney to decide what matters and doesn't matter now you could look at this letter i'm reading and be wildly offended and say, oh my gosh, Dave has done nothing but share the truth here. You might not like that I rented a van, and you might not like that I bought catering for people so that they could have some cold brew coffee and a scone. You might not like those things, but, but the fact that this is a fight you're taking to me is really rich, because this is a, you, you, you say you want to play by the rules of the law. Why are you even emailing me, bro? Why? All I'm doing is covering the case. How bizarre. I said this to Jane. I'm married. I'm not into you. And I'll just say this to you. I've got enough friends. You sound like a cool dude, uh, but we don't have any business uh, talking unless you're suing me or, or something which, you know, you, you know, have been in these threats. But at some point it's like shit or get off the pot, bro. As far as I haven't lied about anything. And the irony is you're, you know, swinging this heavy dick that, uh, that I'm, that I'm in all of these troubles. Okay. 
And, you know, it's, it's free to threaten people in emails, but do it in court if you so believe. He said, uh, justice for Clayton, bro, I want justice for Clayton as much as you do. I want justice for Clayton or Laura or, any, or whoever deserves it. We just don't know who that is yet, but we will. Fun fact, I will explain more about this later, but here's a shocker for you. I have been in Clayton's shoes, literally. I have personally been sued for paternity in the past. A DNA test proved the kid wasn't mine, so my case ended with exactly what Clayton is asking for, a judgment of non-paternity. The difference is that because there is no baby here, Clayton can't prove he wasn't the father, and the burden of proving that is on him, not Laura, since he is the one asking for this finding. The di no, the difference is he was surprised with a with a paternity test and was able to prove it within days. Clayton was dragged into this for nine, 10 months. Still don't ever say, I don't understand what Clayton is going through because I have literally been there myself. No, you were in a simple, you were in a case where you could simply prove your innocence. So different. You need to understand in our case, the only thing that matters is whether Laura actually thought she was pregnant on August 1st. If she shows that we're done. Does that make any difference what she knew later on in October or November? The only thing that counts is what Laura knew on the day she filed the case. A judge can theoretically sanction a person for failing to withdraw a case that was started in good faith, but later was discovered to be groundless. But that's not really Clayton's theory here. Plus, Laura did try to withdraw the case. Clayton's objection is the only reason that did not happen. Obviously, if the whole thing was a setup, then yes, she lied on August 1st and should lose the case and be sanctioned. But no one has shown me any proof showing Laura knew she was not pregnant on August 1st. Greg seems confident he has this proof, but I guess he's just holding back and waiting until the last minute to drop it on me. I look forward to seeing the big reveal because right now it's not there. In fairness to you, I agree there are some grounds to speculate about what happened, but this is not law and order, special Clayton unit. Speculation from Reddit trolls isn't going to cut it in court. The email is long enough, but so let me wrap it up by saying this. I would really prefer not to sue you. I would plant. I have plenty of better things to do. The last thing I want is to have an update my Twitter bio that says willing to fight for your right to speak, even when you're 100% wrong, except for you, Dave Neal. And of course he ended up keeping this in his Twitter bio for a month. That would be such a bad look for both of us. But at the end of the day, if you say that Laura lied about being pregnant, you're putting yourself at huge risk, like huge. I mean, you already said that, so the risk is already there. But if you keep saying it over and over, well, just look at how that turned out for Trump. $5 million for lying the first time, and then $83 million because he kept on lying. Imagine what the number would have been if he did a podcast about her spreading the same lie every day for months. If Laura wins the trial, as I fully expect she will, the next thing that happens after I get back from a well-earned vacation is she and I will sit down and look into whether or not she needs to sue some people. I've done this before and I will do it again if I have to. Don't be that guy. Don't be the next Scott Rothstein. Don't be Alex Jones or Trump. Be the good guy. It's not that hard. Don't force me to make you the next Gingras Law Project. I really don't want to go there. But if you give me no other choice, we will go there. To close this up and to avoid any confusion, no, that doesn't mean you can't talk about the case. I'm not trying to censor you. Talk all you want, please. You just need to be more careful, like a lot more careful. If you don't want to get sued into bankruptcy, you need to stop acting like those before you who ended up in that position. They were arrogant. They thought they were right. They believed the First Amendment would save them. They were all wrong in every way. You need to focus on telling both sides of the story, not just one. If you don't have a lawyer giving you advice on this, you need to seek advice immediately and ask him or her to explain how the fair report privilege works. Because if you do something to take yourself outside of that privilege, the First Amendment isn't going to save you. Ask Alec Jones. I don't mean to brag... But look, I'm a subject matter expert in this area. Because of this, I can tell you confidently, if Laura wanted me to haul you into federal court on a defamation claim, I could easily do that. And based on what I've seen so far, I think you would, be, you would have a very difficult time getting out of that for less than Trump-level bucks. So keep talking. Keep helping Clayton. Keep seeking justice. Just be careful. You owe me $800 for all the wisdom and advice contained in this email. I accept credit cards. Man-to-man... -man, Colin Farrell style, I'm only going to ask you one thing. Don't post this email anywhere yet. I'm not going to post this anywhere. I'm not going to blog about you. After initially engaging with the trolls, that part of my investigation is coming to a close. My focus is elsewhere for now. I don't care if you want to tell people I reached out. You are welcome to say that I contacted you. And if you want to accurately summarize what I said fairly, that's fine. A couple of short quotes from this, no problem. The reason I don't want you to post this or read the whole thing live is I'm starting to realize there's a major troll feeding problem here. That needs to stop. That's why you're going to see less public commentary from me for now. And I'd like to see less from you, at least with regard to this one email. This is a friendly urging, a gentle poke, not a threat, and not a warning shot across your bow. If it gets to that point, I need to fire warning shots. Metaphorically speaking, trust me, you'll know. 
And then he shared a clip. And then I forwarded that email to my lawyer. Well, luckily, as he mentioned here, he really wants um, truth to come out. And he says sunlight is the greatest disinfectant. So we just shine some sunlight on some of the things I've been dealing with with regards to my coverage for the truth. Look, you can donate Super Chats. You can send a Venmo. You can just like it. You can join the Patreon. You can do whatever you want. You can just continue to follow my journey here. I believe the more people that continue to follow this is what's going to prevent me from those defamation lawsuits and all of the ways in which she lied. And I don't believe she was ever pregnant and all these other things. But this just goes to show some of the things going on. And it exists and it kind of sucks because I think it's completely wasted energy from him, from her, and doesn't really help anybody. Uh, but to tell somebody something isn't a threat, it's not really up to him to d decide whether something is a threat or not. That's like someone walking through an alley with a, you know, holding onto a chain late at night telling another person they're not threatening. Let me tell you this right now, Gingris, that's a threat. You're threatening a journalist who's covering a in public interest story. And my belief is the goal was to really get me to tone down all of the research I was doing. Because we didn't, we, un we uncovered many, many other pieces of evidence that proved the statement that your client is a liar. That's going to be it for me today. I'll have more tea for you on the podcast, though. The Rush Hour with Dave Neal this afternoon. Um, I shared some insider information on the morning one, and I'll continue to dribble uh, that content to you as we see fit. Thanks for all the love and support. If you guys read this email any which way like I did, I'm sure it's deeply unsettling. But um, these are the types of emails we don't let the wife read because she'd go into panic mode, which probably is what they want. They want my wife to go into a panic mode, so she says, Dave, stop covering this. You have the family to protect. But the truth is, the only way I can protect my family at this point, and the only way I can protect uh, this idea that um, yeah, I'm going to be homeless, this prediction that his client is going to be enjoying grazing horses in Tennessee once I've been evicted from my home, the only protection I have is to continue to tell the truth. I'll be on Patreon at patreon.com slash Dave Neal.